This week on Case Studies with the BizDoc, it's GitHub. $7.5 billion check was just written from Microsoft to buy the company. Are they going to rot on the vine or is Microsoft going to take them even higher? We're going to find out this week. Leave comments, tell me what you think. GitHub. It all started the history when two guys founded the company. There's actually a third founder and he's kind of quiet, but it was Tom Preston Warner and Chris Wanstroth. They come together to form GitHub. Well, what is a Git and what is a hub of them? Well, what GitHub is, it's a consolidation point and it's a tracking point for software development. A Git is actually a version control mechanism or a team coordination mechanism that was developed by Linus Torvalds. By the way, that's the same Linus that brought us Linux. So you know he's a really, really smart guy. So you have this tracking mechanism need, you need to control versions, you need to get software developers tools so they can work together. Well, GitHub says, what if we made something in the cloud where they could store their code, keep track of versions, keep track of each other, talk to each other, sign off when they finish maybe an open source element for it. In other words, hey, I just adapted your code for this and I'm signing off as it's complete. So they had all of this coming together. In other words, it's a sandbox where developers around the world can come together and work and make magic that you and I love. And companies like, oh, Facebook, IBM, a whole mess of others use it to bring the magic to software and apps and products that we depend on every day. So let's go up the history curve and see how they grew, starting with the bright idea and moving up. In 2009, they had about 46,000 developer accounts that were in place, which was pretty amazing because they just got started in 08 and they basically bootstrapped it with their own money. A year later, they had gotten up to about 100,000, but halfway through 2010, a year after that, they were already at a million. Something was going on and the world was watching and paying attention. Specifically, <laughs> A year later, when they hit 2 million total user accounts and they passed SourceForge and Google to other repositories that allowed developers to work together, store code, and do things like that. And when it's time to grow, what do you need? You need capital, you need venture cash. And who they get with? None other than Andreessen Horowitz. That's right, Mark Andreessen, the developer and inventor of the original Netscape browser who know a thing or two about what developers would appreciate and need. And what they did is they put in $100 million for about 13% of the young GitHub company. And I say young because it's only a few years old, but it's passing some industry giants. An interesting tidbit there is at that time, that was the largest check ever written to date by Andreessen Horowitz, $100 million. From there, the growth continued. Let's check it out. 2013, suddenly they've blown right past 3 million and they're at 5 million unique user accounts. It's really off like a rocket, and it's taken on a global presence. There are developers around the world that are storing code in there, and sometimes they're storing versions to a lot of things that weren't appealing to certain governments. As we go into 2014, things are speeding past 5 million toward 10 million accounts, and something interesting happened. First, India decides to block them because they had some documentation on there that was related to ISIS and the Indian government did not like that and did not want it to be circulated to developers or other people who might be using GitHub for their own purposes. Also, in Russia, they were very upset because there was like a suicide manual that had been put online and Russia wanted to block access to it. In 2015, halfway through the year, China gets upset and China wants to block uh, GitHub for a very simple reason. They were presenting how to avoid internet censorship. Now, if you know anything about the Chinese government, you know, there was a major WTF going on in Beijing when they heard that that sort of information is out there. Uh, they're trying to shut down cable channels and objectionable programming and websites. And, you know, I got to say, China, in the age of the Internet, you're going to be playing whack-a-mole till the return of Christ because get used to it. When one goes down, another's coming up. Nonetheless, it shows you the power and influence that GitHub was having as an enabler of teams of people to come together and collaborate and keep track versions and all of the features that were part of GitHub. In July of 15, the success led to a need for more capital and they went out and they raised 250 
million dollars. That's right, a quarter of a billion dollars. And they raised it from none other than Sequoia. Now there's an interesting thing here that I'd like to point out. If you take a look what I got here, 13% was what Andreessen Horowitz had. Had Andreessen Horowitz not had what's called a top-up right, in other words, the right to invest more at a later date to keep my 13% at 13%, they would have actually gone down to 11.4%. But they kept their top-up right which meant that these numbers came together, Sequoia with 12 and a half, and Andreessen Horowitz with 13. Now why is that important? Because by this time, it is a rare thing that an entrepreneur would still have 75% of the company for the founders and the engineers and the people that have been given stock options in that company. Normally by this time, it's completely flipped. There's about 25% left for management and there's 75% in the hands of the investors that go through the sequential Series A, Series B, Series C, which which is using letters merely to number the investment tranches that happen over time in the company. So GitHub is doing pretty good out in the marketplace and they also did pretty good because they bootstrapped the company basically and when they got to these points, when they took capital, they were highly valuable so they only gave up relatively small percents compared to what other companies would be giving up. That is an important lesson. You can raise capital too late and miss opportunities to invest in things and you can also raise capital too early and give away more of your company early on when maybe you should have reached down deep and bootstrapped or you know used any of the many crowdsourcing options that might be available to you don't be too anxious to raise that capital but don't pass up opportunities to raise capital to grow therein is the tension that every entrepreneur will face so after you've raised that money how are they doing well a report came out in nine months of 2016, it got disclosed that they had actually had approximately $99 million in revenue for the first nine months of 16, but they had lost $68 million, showing that building a global GitHub to serve these all these millions and millions of accounts was not cheap. However, this is showing the kind of scale when you've got the dollars to actually weather those losses as you scale. It puts you in a good place because let's take a look what was happening to the number of user accounts. Number of user accounts was heading to the moon, had passed 10 million in 1415, and by the time they reached early 17 after this loss, which was the first nine months of 16, they were at 20 million plus user accounts. Well, now that they raised this money so to propel them on future growth curve, and certainly they were using it as they went past 10 million subscribers and were heading toward the moon, after nine months of 2016, it was indicated that they had actually had revenue of $99 million. However, they had a loss of $68 million, which means the cost in the middle, $167 million of cost against $99 million of revenue resulting in this loss. So this is what's interesting about growing and scaling companies. Sometimes losses are okay. Twitter did it for a long time. Uber's been doing it since Uber's been around. And we all know what happened to Amazon that finally over time they posted profits. So if you can control the spend and weather the loss as you're growing toward the moon, this, this is something that you can actually sustain. So what I want to step to now, we've talked about the history. Very briefly, I want to talk about a flub that happened to the founder back a couple years ago. And this is before all of the Me Too movement and things that were going on. Tom Preston Werner. His wife is working with him at the company and there is a female developer that says, they're treating me badly, they're treating me harshly, you know, I'm being harassed, uh, he's very dictatorial, he gives feedback in a very demeaning way. So it wasn't sexual harassment, but it was like a, a hostile workplace, a terrible environment, and she became fed up and she filed a complaint. Well, the first thing they did, like everybody else did, is nothing to see here, this is a disgruntled employee, obviously these are outrageous claims. Well, guess what? They spent a couple weeks researching it and the board came to a conclusion that said, you know what? The wife wasn't supposed to be working here. We had an agreement with Tom, number one. Number two, these charges have some merit. So guess what? I think even though he's a co-founder of the company and he owns a big stack of stock, out. And Tom Preston Warner resigned. If you call resigning walking toward the door with the board pushing you on the shoulders resigning, but nonetheless, he resigned. So now you've got bye bye There's a lesson here. 
you can lose it all. Just because you're the founder doesn't mean that you can be a putz when it comes to giving people feedback or just ignore the fact that people's feelings and professionalism are important. And frequently you find people say, hey, if you want to be here and you want your stock options and you want part of this, I am who I am, leave me alone. Guess what? That doesn't fly anymore. And it doesn't fly when you've got harsh emotional harassment and it certainly doesn't fly as we've seen thank you matt lauer thank you harvey weinstein with the me too movement uncovering things that have been going on far too long i digress let's get back to github in this situation well guess what you have two years after this happened in 2017 you still had a little bit of collateral damage here as there were claims that he had set a culture in place and not everything was rosy so there was a few more dynamics that came here that supposedly it was handled. But it's an example of even with Uber, just because Travis has left the company, there were still people that were in there that were made in Travis's image, hired by Travis and upset that he was gone, that hadn't really changed the way they were treating other people and that they were acting. And so they've had to be dealt with as well. So in other words, you can ask a co-founder to leave, but it doesn't necessarily change a culture overnight. Lesson to entrepreneurs, set your culture early. It can be a culture of high accountability and performance and the demands to hit objectives. You just gotta treat the people in the correct way and manage yourself accordingly because it can and will bite you even if you've got $350 million of investment from Andreessen Horowitz and Sequoia. So you've got a company that's been growing like crazy. You've got a board that's done the right thing to help the work environment be healed. And you've got, with all the success, what do you attract? Attention. And attention from who? From Microsoft. And the 28 million developers and the 1.8 million businesses that were working with GitHub at the beginning of 18, Microsoft was the most active among them. In other words, Microsoft at Find says, hey, this GitHub thing works. And they had several of their own products and product groups using GitHub for collaboration and using it to help developers collaborate, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of people that say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Microsoft's been trying to kill open source. Why would they be using or in favor of something that helps collaboration? Well, the times they are changing and Microsoft is changing. Maybe not as fast as some people want, but they are changing. How do we know? Well, they wrote a $7.5 billion check. This is 3.75 times more value just three years later. And there's only one word for that, and that is damn. That is a huge growth curve. Now their percent comes home. So Andreessen Horowitz gets 13 of that, Sequoia 12.5% of that, give or take, that's their returns. Now there's something else that happened this year which was unprecedented and it happened to GitHub. A distributed denial of service. Let me explain what that is. A distributed of denial of service is where some bad actor either uses or commandeers thousands and thousands and thousands of PCs, some of which are infected with viruses that cause them to go into zombie mode so that they can be controlled by these bad actors and they attempt to hit individual websites with so much traffic and force that service is denied. In other words, the website is so busy trying to react to all of this incoming traffic that when you and I try to go there, we can't get there. Have you ever gone to your favorite website or some location that you like and it turns around and around and around and around but you can't get there and you refresh the web browser and you close the browser and start again, it's still here and you can't get to it? One of two things is happening. They're having a distributed denial of service attack or their server is down. Either way, they can't serve you the web page so that you can visit that site. What happened here, it was the largest distributed denial of service traffic hit in history. It was 1.35 terabits. Now let me tell you what a terabit is. If you take a terabit and you divide it by eight, you get 0.16875 terabytes. Now let's turn a terabyte into a megabyte because you and I understand megabytes. Like when our camera phone takes a picture, most of us are taking a picture and that's like a little two megabyte file. So if we text it to somebody or email it to somebody, the data we use for that is gonna be about two megabytes because that's the size of that picture. Well, 0.16875 terabytes is roughly 167,850 megabytes. That's a lot of megabytes. Well, if we Think of the picture at two megabytes. That is 84,375 pictures per second that were being thrown at the website. 
Well, that's just a second. How much is that a minute? That would be like 5.1 million pictures a minute being hit to that website. So if the website is trying to catch all that at once, that was the size of the data coming at it. Now I have another way to look at it. I turn it into a glass of water. Let's say you take a can of your favorite soda and you take a little gulp of it. That's probably about two ounces, give or take. A nice big swig is about two ounces. Well, what if we take those two ounces and apply the same math? That would mean you would have 167,850 ounces per second trying to go down your throat. Well, there's 128 ounces in a gallon, so that would be 1,318 gallons per second that you're trying to drink. So picture yourself taking a little swig of soda and someone that tries to drown you hits you with 1,318 gallons per second. So now when you convert that and you imagine it in something we can understand that's that much water, that's what happens in a distributed denial of service. Some bad actor gets all those computers together Boom, and they hit GitHub, and it brought it to its freaking knees. Now, these are smart technologists, so they quickly figure out how to stop the DDoS and how to reroute traffic and to do things to get out of it so that people that are using GitHub can get back to it. Nonetheless, I thought that would be an interesting lesson, converting that kind of traffic to something we understand, a swig of soda. Now let's take a look at a couple of the reasons that Microsoft has actually published as for the additional rationale. First of all, they said we need to be developer focused. And if this is the leading tool in the known universe for doing something like this, then we need to be in and why wouldn't we own it? Additionally, they took Nat Friedman, who's the corporate VP of developer relations. He's gonna be plugged in as the division president or CEO of GitHub when the deal closes. You also take a look at cloud and you look at the amount of effort that Microsoft already was putting in being an active user and suddenly this starts to make sense. So time will tell whether Microsoft pulls it off or it's the old Microsoft that going back to their old ways and GitHub dies a terrible death. Kind of the way Time Warner killed AOL and other big companies have bought promising things in life and we've just watched them rot on the vine. I hope they make it because I'm in favor of developer tools that enable the magic of software to make more stuff for me tomorrow than I have today because I dig using it in my life. Love to hear what you think about it. Leave some comments below. I attempt to get to as many as I can. You can also follow me over on Instagram. And remember, Valuetainment is on a mission to get to a million subscribers. And when we do, the first annual Valuetainment Conference for Entrepreneurs with Patrick Bet David, yours truly, the BizDoc, and other leaders showing you how to drive your business, drive yourself, and to leave people around you better than you found them. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you. Mm -hmm.